and welcome to the uh, outer talk series, uh, a series of talks hosted by me, uh, where I talk to different uh, artists uh, about their ideas in music and about uh, how they realize uh, their different projects and so on and so on. And um, today, it's very great to have Nana P. Obu Kim here. Let's give her a big hand. Um, I always like to start out uh, by hearing a little bit about how you got started with music, because I, I think that's always super interesting how people s get into uh, what they're doing. Like, wh how, how did you begin your musical journey? Oh, yes, I, I began uh, actually having a boyfriend who played music. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my first encounter mm -hmm. for that. I was like, wow, this is so amazing. And then I was at the gymnasium and found that it was a little bit too gray for me. And I dropped out, didn't know what to do. And mm -hmm. then I found out that there was the free youth education that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there I found the saxophone. And then I started playing saxophone. And it was an alto in the beginning, right? Yes, I was told that it was better uh, to start with a smaller uh, saxophone. Okay. Even though I was 19 when I started. Mm -hmm. um, and then I found out that that was not the instrument I wanted to play. I play, wanted to play tenor, so mm -hmm. I bought a tenor instead after a year, I think. Okay, after a year you were already on tenor? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I studied in, um, in Chichester College. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up at the jazz line mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. uh, because I was the only wind instrument on the pop line. So they didn't find that I was fitting. So okay. I actually never had a lesson there. I just had the first introduction and then I was moved to the jazz line. Okay. Um, and that was a little bit scary for me because I had played a month at that time. Okay. Uh, and I didn't know anything. Um, but I was very like, wow, this is amazing, I just want to do it. And I remember the first time I was, um, uh, I was playing with other people. Uh, it was um, where his, the, the teacher there the, who should categorize us like in what level we were. Mm -hmm. We were like in a... A circle and we're told to improvise over C major scale and I was the only one who had no clue of what that was. Good for you. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, so the teacher had to like um, uh, play the tones and then I had to find them. And I later found out that that was the A major scale for me uh, on the ah. alto. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I of course got into the the, the worst. <laughs> <laughs> if you can say that, we were all really bad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this, this, in these early formative years, you were just kind of learning how to play the saxophone and playing jazz like uh, everybody else. Uh, on yeah. That, like, and then at some point, something happened uh, where you started uh, hearing something uh, of I your own, of your own of music. Of my own yeah. music. Uh, yeah, I think I was, for a long time of my life, I was kind of a scapes musician. I don't know what that is. Classic musician. Classic musician. <laughs> uh, and I was really scared of playing with my friends because I was uh, um, a manager on a jazz house in Odense. Uh -huh. And all of them, including you, coming by, right. playing really great. and. Uh, once here and there I was asked if I wanted to jam I always said no hmm. because I was like kind of I knew I was too old in a way to, I was too uh, aware of myself hmm. of what I could do and what they could do and I was afraid that they would not be my friends anymore oh, like okay. this kind of thing okay, yeah. um, but then I went into MGK and then the conservatory later on and then it kind of swifted but I think it was at the conservatory in Malmö that I found out like my place in music mm -hmm. because improvised music started to happen for me there 
I was introduced to that, and yeah, so I think for a long time I was just afraid of actually playing. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what is it about improvised music that is so interesting? I think for me is that there is no no one saying you cannot do that. Uh, Um, everything is kind of allowed as long as you hear it. Um, and I found out that I could uh, do extended techniques and put objects on my instrument and that suddenly made me realize that I had a huge vocabulary mm. where before I felt a little bit locked in having to play this note at this time or like, right. yeah. But I still I play standards every Friday. Um, you do. I have a Friday jam in Valencia. Okay. So I still have that thing as well. Yeah. Nice. So this um, you're saying that when you improvise, you feel it like everything is allowed. <sighs> yes. I mean, you once intuition is more clear for me, mm. and I don't have. Uh, negative thoughts about right. if I'm doing it okay or like I don't I feel like I can explore mm. my own sounds yes but then when you're time. listening to other people improvise how do you how do you judge that uh, experience uh, whether it's good or bad or do you have any like s things that you listen for that uh, interest you or <sighs> Because I always thought this is kind of a key question in a way about how to relate to free improvisation because um, it can still sound good or bad. Mm. And it's like, what is it that makes it sound good or bad? Because if everyone just feels whatever they want to feel and do whatever they want, it doesn't necessarily create good music. No. It could be a, a wonderful experience for that person who feels super free, but the music might not be become anything. So I'm just wondering, like, what is it, what is it that kind of qualifies? Uh, I mean, I know what I think, but I'm curious about what you think about that. Yeah, I think it's like, I think I'm drawn to music where I can, f where I, as a listener, feel that there is no limit somehow and that they are intuitive and connecting like immediately and I also think that uh, the best experience I've had is like as a listener but also playing is when when I'm improvising or if I listen to improvised concerts because mm. it becomes more real when it's really working um, and uh, There's of of course musicians where you are more on the same path, um, but I really like playing with ad hoc groups where you don't necessarily know the musicians beforehand. Um, but I also really like to have groups where we only meet and improvise. Um, I have a group called Tactical Maybe mm -hmm. that uh, is with uh, Louise uh, Dam Eckert Jensen and Tom Plankard and my husband, mm -hmm. Halim Obukim. And I feel that we have a very special, like I kind of knew before uh, setting it up that it would be great and mm -hmm. that scared me a little bit because what if it's not great? What if it's gonna disappoint me? But mm -hmm. we've been playing for a while now and also release an album and I think every time we play it's great so far. Mm. Uh, but I think it's, I like this chaotic sound mm -hmm. and that it's um, um, mm, like I feel like my flow is just that there's like an output somehow right and not this hesitating and mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah so to your question I think it's about uh, when when people had dug into their own vocabulary and are able to get it out mm -hmm. yeah 
you you are um, very active as a uh, organizer of things, but you also uh, have worked out your own system uh, that you use a lot uh, for, uh, as a way of conducting a larger group. You, mm. you call it extempor extemporize. Extemporize, yeah. yeah. Can you can you speak a little bit of, uh, a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. Why did you create it, and what does it do? Uh, I started creating it because I met Lodanga, who has uh, her own signs, mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, that was one of the encounters in um, in the conservatory where I was like, wow, this is amazing. Another person is telling me what to do. So my own kind of uh, judging mindset was like kind of away because I was like, okay, play loud. Then I played loud, you know, like it mm -hmm. was very specific. Um, and I was also teaching at that time. Uh, and I felt that a lot of the students that I was teaching were looking in a book or trying to play mathematically correct and this, but had horrible sounds on their instruments. And I was like, I need to get them more aware of what they're doing and what they can do in their, the hood. Well or farewell, I don't know, like. Choices. And, and uh, non choices, or like choices. what happens in the music. And I also did it in school at once where they played standards. And. Uh, and it was really interesting for me to give them signs while playing the standard because then it changed totally. Like where the bass uh, player would normally play walking bass, he suddenly had to do something differently because I asked him to, and the music opened up in a new way. So what are your what signs do you have? Like how how can you? Uh Control the, mm -hmm. For this, example, this. like a simple sign is like this that is change direction. And then you just change direction. Yeah, and I like this working with the uh, your intuition in this moment, mm -hmm. like where and try to have the participants not think about, not overthink, just react. Um, that could be one. There's also swift, where you like you're doing something and then I say show the sign and then maybe like this short tones and then change it to short tones go back or like text oh, okay. and so I can change and mm. yeah back and forth between two areas yeah so, yeah mm. yes there's many different signs I think I have 53 signs now okay but I try not to have too many signs yeah because I don't think more signs becomes better yeah yeah I worked with uh, Butch Morris uh, mm -hmm. when I was living in New York, and uh, you know he it would be like you know, no, no, <laughs> like <laughs> it, would, it would like start something and it would be like no, <laughs> like it seemed like a very frustrating thing. For, like he was hearing very specific things. He was really hearing it like a like a, he was really com really composing. composing. Yeah, uh, and I'm I understand that what you have going on is, is kind of different in that way it's more a, it's it's a way of organizing improvisers or how, how would you say how would you say your, your thing is I mean, different from Butch Morris's uh, I'm not so I try to as a conductor not to have a, an idea beforehand to actually listen to I start something of course mm -hmm. I start two or three signs and then I listen to where the music is going and then I try to follow the musicians as well as not just me pointing out because I don't know what is coming right. if I do a sign. So I kind of try to be on zero and not. So if you give somebody a sign and they don't follow that sign, is the music then ruined? No. No. I it just put it in another direction. And I mean, I would maybe be insecure if I give uh, soft and the person play loud or if I mm. give high and they play low and then I would probably be a little bit uh, yeah, what am I doing and what are yeah. you doing yeah. so in that sense then there would be some uncertainties but mm -hmm. um, and I also did Lydna no, always recently where I actually composed in a way like I went around Aarhus and did the field recordings and then I asked, I recorded it and made the musicians in Extemporize Orchestra to listen to it and then we had 10 or 12 different themes, mm -hmm. um, like seagulls 
for example, because there's a lot of seagulls in Aarhus. Yes. And that was amazing that they listened to these recordings and actually found these sounds on the instruments, mm -hmm. like that you could actually hear seagulls. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Um, was the snow leopard participating in that? Because no. he always talks about playing seagulls okay. sounds Damn. on his guitar. Yeah. No, I didn't ask And I'm him. sick and tired of the <laughs> one. Um, yeah, no, but... Uh, Next yeah. time. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so um, when you work with Extemporize, it's a fixed band of people who are kind of dedicated to your vision of... Yeah, kind uh, of. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you also use it as a, a tool when you do workshops and... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think for me with this going to a city and listening to the sounds, it's also for me to having this, like, um, what can I do as a performer to make people listen to experimental sounds? And I was right. thinking if they feel they can recognize some sounds in acoustic instruments, that they normally hear in the city, mm -hmm. maybe they will get another understanding of improvisation. They'll open up their ears yeah. a little bit, yeah. That's my, my idea, at least. Mm. Yeah. You, you have done a lot of uh, work. Uh, uh, well, you are partly running this club with, with some other people. You're doing a lot of work on this club, but then mm. you also do this um, Stevne, which I don't know the English word for. A camp. Or camp, or yes. Impo it's called Impo Camp. Impo Camp, yeah. yes. Uh, which has been going on for four or five years now. It's the sixth year this sixth summer? Sixth year, yeah. Coming and, up. And I have uh, the impression that that makes a big difference uh, on the scene. Uh, a lot of people, uh, especially younger people who maybe don't, uh, are not such a big part of a scene yet, they kind of start out there and move on. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a, a little bit about this work you're doing with that, the yeah. camp? I mean, you also inspired me a little bit about that because we had accordion track. Right. But it was for maybe more upcoming, or I had the feeling that it was more upcoming musicians. And um, I realized that there is not really any camps in Europe right. where young people can go and improvise and learn this language. And right. I think that even though you won't play improvised music later on in your life, you still learn a lot mm. on like allowing yourself to speak when you want to speak. and. Mm -hmm and hold back when you are not supposed to speak. There's like a lot of things you can adapt to real life and also in your other music. And at least that's also what I hear from mm. them uh, who participate. And I mean, a lot of them is coming back. So I think it's a good camp in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's like now there's people from Germany and Sweden and Norway and yeah, I think also Holland, Netherlands, and yeah. So what what are the values behind this project? Like if you would just say like, what's the most important thing about it that it does? I mean, I try to book, I always book five instructors mm -hmm. uh, that I like somehow, uh, and that I also hope have a pedagogic kind of view on things, right. you know, mm -hmm. um, because it should be a place where they develop and not being told not to do something, kind of. Um, so I think the value of it is that they learn different ways of uh, improvising, different approaches and also different musicianships, different personalities uh, on how to to perform, like I had Marcella Lucatelli. Mm -hmm. She has a very strong character in what she's doing. Um, and I had Stuart Eriksson, who's also a very strong character in what he's doing. You know, so it's mm -hmm. like different aspects on how to improvise. And I think improvising is such a big field mm -hmm. and so many ways of doing it. And yeah. um, But I think another value is also the networking that I see that it's blossoming and it's like they start to work and meet in different, like on their own terms, mm. like uh, creating bands together and stuff like that. Um, and <sighs> it's, I don't know, like it touches me a lot to see young people get so overwhelmed by being in the camp. like. A lot of them wants to stay there a whole year, kind of like, mm. or uh, 
you know, are really sad when it ends because they have just given all of their heart to this right. week. Um, yeah. Is there an age uh, limit or? It starts from 18 and then the limit is 35, but 18 is set because they are supposed to be able to sleep on their own and not having somebody who is... Improvising. Improvising, on on, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but mostly it's like from 20 and upwards. Mm -hmm. But you can also be 36 or 37 if, yeah, if you are able to sleep in two rooms on, a, on the ground with your own... Uh, mattress and stuff like that, right. then everyone is actually welcome. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, one, one thing I uh, always ask uh, at these talks, it's, become, it's something that I think about a lot, is the relationship between um, composition and improvisation. Mm. Um, the fact that, at least that's how I feel, like the second you introduce any idea then it's not improv improvisation anymore. Like, mm -hmm. even if, I mean, if we were going to play a duo concert mm -hmm. now and, and I said, uh, let's play soft, uh, well, then already then it's over in mm -hmm. a way. Like, it's not an improvised concert anymore. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, um, I know a lot of composers who compose music to liberate the improvising, like somebody like Tim Byrne, you know, mm. would always write this really complex music and then he would say, but I don't care about all the stuff I wrote, the only reason I'm doing this music mm. is because then we have another way of getting into the improvising, which is what I really care about. Mm. But if you come from all this stuff into the blowing, then it's another situation, then mm. this thing of, okay, and now we're going to improvise, you know, and you're like, starting from zero, which is, in a way, always start the same beginning, mm, in, mm, a, in a way. Mm. Um, any thoughts on this relationship between these two very different uh, entities in music? Yes, I mean, I have the, the extemporized where it's like conducted improvisation, you can say, but the, the participants don't know what's coming. I'm the only one who is kind of knowing what is coming, like, in, in the act. Mm. Um, and even that is very intuitive, you yes, told me. Yeah. Yes. So you are in a way improvising with, with the band. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but when we did the Little Noah, who's I had like a, a fixed plan, but that actually uh, was suffocating me a little bit because mm -hmm. that's not where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. So at many times I diversed from it, or how you say, like, went away, and it was actually a struggle for me that I had this paper, I didn't want it. Mm. Actually, I realized, but it was the first time for me doing it. Mm. Um, so Plus somebody paid you to do a little bit so it would be kind of, you're not <laughs> doing what you're asked to do. Yes, I was also so afraid if I didn't go through the team yeah. things, would have then yeah. show Lilna Aarhus. Right. So I had this limitation uh, as well. But I think it went well. In the end, it was mostly just my struggle, mm -hmm. like in the act. But um, um, right now, I'm trying to compose with my textures, the textures that I developed on my instrument, and, and putting them into uh, like loops or grooves and stuff and melodies. Um, I'm composing for Nislo ones at the moment. Um, and those musicians really like to improvise. So I don't feel like if I come with a, uh, an idea that then they are limited. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's like they your are first not, band, right? Of yes. Yeah, you've yeah. had that band for eight years yes. or mm -hmm. more years. More years, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'm working in both fields, of, but personally, I really love not to have any mm. any um, preset composition. Um, but I think they can work together as long as you're also able to throw them out. Yeah, you know, but. But I must say, in Nieselhorns, we kind of play compositional with improvised things in between. Right. Um, but we can also stick out of it, of course. But, um, but with, for example, tactical, maybe I don't think ever there's going to come a composition. Like, I don't think any one of us will bring a composition. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that has a strong value as well. Um, yeah, so I don't know. What was your question again? Oh, yeah, it's just a, 
you're answering it. I mean, it's just, it's just the relationship between composition and improvisation. I feel that um, the way that, that the system is rigged, the mm -hmm. way that our society works, yeah. uh, it, it's, they don't really know what to do about free improvisation because nobody owns any ideas. I mean, it, it's, uh, so in that way, like, how can you, I mean, it's, it's very difficult, difficult for society to um, pay uh, improvisers. It's much easier to deal with composers. So there, there's a whole system that works that, you know, I'm asking you to write a piece for me and you mm. give me a piece and then there's something going on here that looks like something that we know from other aspects of society. Yeah. But the f improvisational thing uh, as an art, f one thing is the whole like, um, you know, the, the social aspect of it and the, the psychological aspect and how, how it can, you know, help us become better people and how mm. people who listen to the choices we make when we improvise, they, they learn and grow as, as people by listening to that. Mm. But it's, it's a very, like, uh, unselfish thing that's very difficult to, to uh, get a hold of uh, in, in our society. And I think um, what often happens is that uh, improvisers end up having to be composers or we know it from like the first generation of the, the, the Chicago scene, you know, all, all those uh, amazing improvisers who all became composers, you know, Braxton, mm. Wadada Liu Smith, Roscoe Mitchell, you know, mm. all these people are known for a compositional, uh, they created their own system mm. and uh, and that's the only way they could survive uh, in a place like America because then you, you have to then you can say oh this is mine I created this and mm. this is this costs so and so much money mm. um, and the totally free improvised situation yeah it, it doesn't fit into uh, the, the way society works I think As so the common uh, uh, common listeners don't yeah they don't know what to do about it. And they don't know. It's hard for people to f know when what it what it is and mm. when when it does what it does. Uh, it's it's very like. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's also what uh, occupy occupy me, and that's why I did Luno Who's or do Info Camp because I want to um, have it more exposed to people. And I think the the biggest thing in this uh, question is that. Uh, the platforms, like for example, Poo the Jazz, right. they they yeah. don't don't explore it, right? The listeners it doesn't, work doesn't on the know radio, that exists, you know. right? Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think um, we should have more platforms to work on, and mm -hmm. that's also why I do the work for Primi. Right. Because this is a platform where we actually can exist mm -hmm. and I apply for funding with the group of Primi to make make us having like to get the normal value. Like it should I mean yeah. I have the feeling that a lot of improvisers we're like, Yay, we're getting the tariff mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Where in classical uh, music it's like it's another it, kind it, of tariff. That's that's yeah. just yeah, it's another kind of tariff yeah. and yeah. And we are like, wow, they get so much more money. And mm -hmm. it's also because, as you say, it's more understanding that you have to work if you're making a composition, right? Mm -hmm. But there's not this, um, uh, people don't really understand how much work there's behind being able to improvise, right? right. You need to work on your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. You can't be intuitive if you don't work on your sounds mm -hmm. and, and work That's on your instrument. That's a full-time job to it's, be an yeah. improviser, yeah. The classical guys and, and girls, they are also paid for all the work they have to do. Like if they accept a concert, mm -hmm. it means they have to spend three weeks preparing yeah. for that piece. Or, yeah. you know. So, I mean, in, and in that sense, you could just get up now and play a concert mm -hmm. uh, without any other preparation than the fact that you prepared your whole life yeah. to, to do that. And I'm, 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 I'm practicing doing it on my own, right? Like, right. It's, and how I do think you, that how do you practice uh, your instrument? <sighs> like it, uh, I do play a little bit standards. I must admit, I have, I really like that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, and that's maybe also because I have the Friday jam, where I'm playing standards, and I don't want to be like, ah, oh, I don't know that. Uh, 
you know? I have to do that sometimes, I don't know it, because mm. sometimes you don't know it. But I prefer to just, even though I might uh, fail, I've learned to just take the step, uh, take the step forward instead of being like, no, I don't dare, mm. and then just try it out. I mean, as long as you kind of know the key, you cannot fail totally. Mm. Um, um, yeah, but I practice a lot right now on circular breathing and putting a, a cop in, and then my my uh, C sharp uh, key is like, and I'm practicing keeping that steady, and then I can change the this kind of the vibration of how much it's like reacting and this kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's like what I do a lot at the moment with a lot of pauses in between because it's super hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I'm like I have a tube that I've had for ages, where I don't, I have no clue on what uh, tones I'm playing, and it, I, I know that it's like quarter tones, and it does like there's no really scale, and it's yeah, it's fucked up. It's yeah, I'm trying to put that in a system, um, but that's also partly why I, like that started. My interest for that was because I wanted to do composition for nasal horns, so now I'm trying to work out what tones do I actually play when I'm playing with my tube. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I do a lot of different things. I also just put on um, a record and then I play with it. Spiral Jive and break it. Ape or soul. Play that. No. Okay. Uh, it's, it's but really what great, do it's you great do? To talk to. I don't practice at all. No, yes, that's the thing. That's your thing. Years. Um, that's cool. I don't believe, I mean, I used to practice a lot. Yeah. Uh, For me, it's kind of like my, I get endorphins, I think. Yeah. I believe I do. I get happier when I, I've played and if I touch my instrument and and yeah, that I'm in a routine of that. Um, but if I only practice on my own and don't play any concerts for a while or don't have any sessions, mm -hmm. my mood goes down. Right. Like, I, I need these encounters of different people. Mm -hmm. And then I realized also that uh, I want to do more, like, because when you said also uh, products of like when you do compositions, right? It's a project you can say I made this, right? Mm -hmm. And for us improvisers, it's also a project when you make a record, even though it doesn't really sell or you don't really earn anything yeah. on it. Mm -hmm. It's still like you can say in 2021, I did this, right? Yeah, right. And mm -hmm. it's it's a nice postcard to yourself that you, yeah, that you're creating. Mm -hmm. I think it's. Like I feel like, I, like I'm creating when I'm organizing this, right? right? Um, but I also want to like find a better balance because I'm organizing a lot and that can take over and then I'm not really using enough time on my compositional work or my improvising work and like making products that I can be proud of mm. uh, on my own kind of, my own stamp. Yeah. yeah. I just realized that I actually do practice uh, the piano. Mm. Yeah. The Hammond or the yeah, piano? Yeah, the, the organ and the oh, piano. Yeah. But I, mean, I think <coughs> it's this thing of when you, when you play a kind of music where it's possible to play where it clearly is wrong. I think this is also what you talk about a bit, playing test standards. You mm. know? There yeah. it's clear that if you... You fucked up Yeah, you made, this was clearly a mistake <laughs> what you just played, you know. And, um, and in imp improvised music, I guess that also happens, but it's not as uh, clear what it is you know, mm. when, when it works or when it doesn't work. And it can be many factors that you know, define whether it was successful or not. Or not. And yeah. in the end, you, maybe something may happen on stage and something completely different happens uh, to the audience. Mm. So there's really no telling when it, you yeah. know, it's, it's so vast. It's much more blur because like, if you play uh, uh, Ask Me Now, for example, and you, there's a lot of changes in that standard. And mm. if you play it wrong, you can hear it. And mm. also because people know it 
mm. already. So there That's is the thing, yeah. there is a setup, right? You then you just go. <laughs> yes, change. I <laughs> asked myself <laughs> to change direction, and I did. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I have no sense of time. What time is it? Never. What? Never. Never. What, what the hell? 8 15. Um, that's, that's good. That's good. I think. Do, 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 you have, do you have any questions for. Do you have any questions for Nana? I think we've covered a lot. We've covered a lot of ground today. I forgot to ask you a lot of questions. Yeah. Oh, um, I, I just because uh, I've been doing these talks for uh, I don't know four years, and I've spoken to a lot of different people, and there was one, there were there were two actually two different conversations that I remember very clearly. One was talking to Axel Derner, mm -hmm. the great trumpet player, mm -hmm. and he said, I asked him, you know, well, how do you work? You know, what's what's your daily routine of practicing? And he said, most of the time I spend listening to recordings, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know takes that people want to release with me mm. all the time. I do a tour, they record a gig, and then I have to listen to, to that music back. Mm. And I spend a lot of time on that. And I said, you know, but why don't you just, I mean, because he sounded like it was kind of a drag that he had to do that yeah. so much. And then I was like, why don't you just, you know, not listen to it mm. and don't care? I mean, mm. just tell them, yeah, it's great, put it out, you know. Yeah. And then he said, um, no, because it's part of the profession. Mm. To do that, yeah, it's like it's your responsibility as an artist to make sure that uh, what is released uh, lives up to. Mm. And I thought that was a very nice way to think about that. You know, it's just part of the it's part of the job mm. in a way that you have to listen to what people release. But I guess he also learns a lot by listening to I oneself so. and like. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. This part is the problem is they're filming this. Um, and then um, <laughs> Okay, no do it here. And no, I'm trying to write. And the other thing that, that was um, uh, I remember uh, when I spoke to Tristan Honsinger, mm -hmm. the great cellist, yeah. and he said this thing that I still think about, which is, you know... So the Berlin people, you... Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's true, yeah. They were at Europe, and that's why. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he said when, when you improvise, um, you, get an, you get an idea, you, you get a, a, a feeling that you have to do something. Mm -hmm. And um, by then, you already had to be doing it, even though you don't know what it is you're doing. If you wait to hear what it is your idea is, then it's too late. Yeah. And so, I think that is when music is, when you hear as a listener, when it's the best, yeah. when people are able to go with it without, to really, be ahead of themselves. without really thinking yeah. about it. Just and of course, that means that uh, then you can't censor yourself in any way. Mm. And uh, but it, because it goes on faster than you than you can uh, follow in your own head what yeah. you're doing. And it's uh, I think I think that's a, a beautiful way to think about mm. it. You know that it's really uh, it's happening so so quickly that uh, you just have to you're like a, a nanosecond in the future mm. all the time. Yeah. yeah, like reading a book. Yeah. Except when I read, it's like <laughs> out loud. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Great. Really nice. To, nice to talk to you. Give a big hand to it. <laughs>